Welcome everybody to Dead Talk Live, and tonight we have with us acclaimed director of such movies as House on Haunted Hill, Fear.com, William Malone. William, thank you so much for being here with us. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you so much for having me on your show. Well, I've been and hi everybody. <laughs> I, I've been very much looking forward to this interview, and so have uh, a lot of my team members and our viewers as well. Now, let's just get right to it. You have been in this industry for a while. Is it safe to assume that you are retired? Uh, no, actually not. Oh. I, uh, no, uh, uh, sort of COVID retired me here for a little while, but uh, no, I actually had a film project in the works just before the COVID thing hit. So, uh, awesome. No, you know, I, I think it, it, I kind of follow that thing of uh, you can. They'll have to pry the camera out of my dead hand. <laughs> and you know what? Almost every, whether it's an actor, filmmaker, it's all been the same answer when it comes to any time the question of retirement comes up. The The response that I get, it's like asking me to stop breathing. Do you feel the same way? Yeah, I mean, look, I, I've been, I, I started making little movies, I think when I was 12 years old and my parents brought me bought me an eight millimeter camera and you know uh i just can't imagine not doing it you know so it's, it's awesome just, it's awesome it's what it is. so you've been in this this the entertainment industry now for 40 plus years uh you know with regard to the horror genre you have seen it go through a lot of changes what are your thoughts on where horror is right now in terms of popularity and, you know, the quality of films that we're getting right now? It was a good question. I mean, you know, um, boy, it's it's changed a lot. I think uh, uh, what's happened is that the, the business has changed so drastically, uh, you know, primarily, I guess, because of the Internet and also the availability of cameras and stuff like that. So there's a lot of films out there. And I think because there's so much content, it is it is in some ways hurt the quality of films. I, I think that there's, there, um, there certainly are still good films being made, but, but I think when you had to shoot film, uh, there was sort of a, uh, you know, you had to know more about filmmaking, I guess. Is, yeah. It was, you know, to yeah. actually go do it. <laughs> Computers have made it a lot easier now for people yeah. to get involved. And in regard to the content, you're absolutely right. Uh, when I want to watch a movie, let's say I don't have a movie specifically to watch and I just want to sit on my couch and browse, I got to research before I sit down because there's so much content out there. Well, yeah, I mean, it's funny because last night, actually last night I was talking with my wife and we were sitting there watching, I think it was Netflix. We were scrolling through and we were I don't even know where to begin. Exactly. I don't know. You know, and I thought, you know, maybe we should just do a thing where we start each movie and give it like 15 minutes and if it's, if it's you know and just move on if it's not good i don't know i don't know how else to deal with it you know i know this um, francis coppola i think said when digital cameras first started coming out uh, he said something like that he thought it was going to be wonderful that everyone it just means there's going to be tons of great movies coming out. no no, it was just, there's just a bunch of, a lot of junk. <laughs> yeah, there's a bunch of everything. Now, you are known primarily for your work in horror, but you have done the full spectrum from comedies to a little bit of everything all the way through horror. Uh, how do you feel about sort of being uh, labeled as this uh, horror director, great horror director? Well, thank you. Actually, uh, actually I'm totally thrilled with it because that's what I started out being. I actually got kind of got into it sort of sideways because I was working at this company called Don Post Studios. And uh, we used to make masks, but we also made a, a effects stuff for films and so forth. And, and directors would come in, this is in the seventies, directors would come in. And for the most part, they were directors who hated horror, but they somehow got stuck with doing a horror film. So they would ask for just terrible stuff. And I went, God, you know, I love it. Why are you doing this? You know, so I think that sort of propelled me into said, oh, well, at least I can do better than this guy because I love it. Exactly. Know, so. Do something that you love. Now, take us back. You brought up the 70s. Take us back to the 70s. Not just horror. What was the entertainment, the entertainment industry like back then? And that's well, so different from today. Well, it's very different. I mean, you know, 
first of all, when you think about the movies that were out in the 70s, to my mind, was a horrible period for just about everything except for movies. <laughs> you know? the music sucked. The wardrobe sucked. It was just terrible. But but, the, but you had movies like The Godfather and Chinatown, and and those are movies that wouldn't get made today. Wow. You, those, no studio would finance those movies today, and it's a shame because, you know, um, you know, that's that's kind of what I, I think is a sad thing about what we're seeing happen. I'll tell you what, I took, uh, my wife actually took my two teenage boys and sat them down and they all watched The Godfather and The Godfather Part 2 and The Godfather Part 3. They, on their own now, they will just go back and just rewatch the whole thing again. They fell in love with it. It's a classic, it's a timeless classic. And why do you think like movies like The Godfather would not be made today? Well, I think because the, the studio is now considered like a niche audience you know, and they're all about the blockbuster yeah. and, you know, and not that those occasionally some movies, uh, you know, like maybe Phantom Thread or one of those things get made, but they don't have the budget that like no. Coppola had when he was making, you know, uh, the Godfather movies. And, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's just an entirely different world. And all they want to do now is just make big blockbuster you know, mostly guys in tights uh, movies, you know. Now, let me ask you a question. Going back to the 70s, 80s, even the early 90s, uh, let's take Paranormal Activity. It was done on a zero $10,000 budget. Was that even heard of back then? I mean, what was the minimum you needed to actually put a film together? Well, yeah, I don't th I don't think you could make a movie. Well, I, I take that back. I mean, look, right. Robert Rodriguez made his first movie, I think, for seven thousand dollars or something. It made a lot of money, but, but generally speaking, I mean, I made a, my first movie was Scared to Death, and that cost seventy four thousand dollars, and that was just unheard of to make a movie that for cheap. you know, for, for that cheap. And uh, you know, if you look back, I mean, I think Halloween, I believe, cost about three hundred thousand dollars, and that was considered a low budget film. So. You know, now today, three hundred thousand dollars is, is a big budget. <laughs> it's a good budget now if you have three hundred thousand dollars. And um, now, the early part of your, of your career, you you did some acting. So, was your aspirations oh, I, were to yeah, get never, into acting, or and then you? No, you, I, I was never an actor. I, I still, you know, I, I only did it just out of a, a lark or something. Or okay. somebody say, come over and do something, you know. So your passion has always been with filmmaking. Right, right. As a filmmaker, yeah. No. So, I mean, that's mainly what I wanted to do. And I remember, actually, there was a day when I quit Don Post Studios, and I said, from today on, I'm a director. I haven't directed anything, but from today on, I'm a director. So, uh, along with directing, you have produced, you have written. Uh, let's take writing, for example. Is writing something, looking back, that you wish you would have explored more than you did? Or are you perfectly satisfied? Well, you know, look, I, you always want to be better at your craft, whatever it is. And I certainly wish that I were a better writer than I am. And, you know, and, and if you look at my script, I, usually on the first page of my script, it always says, be better today, <laughs> you know, be better today than yesterday. And I, and I feel that way about writing. You know, I, I, you want to try and do as good a job as you can. And I love good writing. I mean, I, there's some movies that I just, I mean, I, I adore like Sunset Boulevard, mm -hmm. you know, Billy Wilder's films and stuff like that and, and Double Indemnity and my God, the writing in those films are so wonderful, yes. and, you know, and that's that's what you aspire to, you know, and and I always felt like there's no reason why horror shouldn't be like that. I mean, it should horror, you know, I, I never wanted to make movies that I felt like I was talking down to the audience, mm -hmm. you know. So now, uh, you know, you've done so much directing when it came time for you to work with the writer to get the writer's idea of what they were, you know, trying to portray. Uh, how'd you find working with all the different various writers in your career? Uh, nor, you know, did you guys click? Mostly, yeah, mostly. I, I mean, I get along really well with writers. I mean, because I, I understand what they're doing and, and, you know, I have great respect for good writing. And uh, mostly the stuff I've done, of course, has been stuff I've written. But uh, on television stuff, particularly, you know, there's been a lot of stuff which I didn't write. And uh, yeah, I didn't write Fear.com and I didn't write a lot of, a lot of TV shows. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, 
But yeah, I mean, in a way, getting uh, when you get a, a script from a, a, a somebody who's not you know not your own script, uh, the beauty of it is you get a perspective that you don't have on your own stuff. You know, mm-hmm. the, 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 you could see it in a way. You can see it more clearly, even though you know when you make you write something, you have all the stuff in your head, but you 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 don't have a good perspective on it. You really yeah. don't. That's you know, true. So. That, I never thought of it that way. So let's get to one of your biggest films uh, directing, and that is House on Haunted Hill. Uh, tell us how, you know, you directing that movie and how did it come your way? Well, uh, actually, it came about because I had um, directed an episode of Tales from the Crypt called yes. Only Skin Deep, which uh, the producers really liked. And uh, so they wanted me to to do some other stuff, which in the, in the interim between that, I did some other things for him. I did a, another Tales from the Crypt and then one in England, in fact, and then a, a show called um, Perversions of Science mm-hmm. uh, and then um, a, a made for TV movie and stuff. And and so I got a call. I think this is probably about, I think about 19, late 1997, I got a call from uh, uh, Joel Silver who said that, they had bought the rights to the William Castle catalog and that they were thinking about making a, doing a remake of House on Haunted Hill. And I said, I am on board. I said, because first of all, I, I was thinking, my, I'd been thinking for quite a while. I said, I want to do a ghost movie, yeah. you know? So it was like perfect, was a ghost movie, House on Haunted Hill. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's how it sort of got started. Um, there was a writer, uh, uh, I brought I brought on the writer from my uh, crypt episode, which I had only met on that uh, episode. A guy named Dick Beebe, who was a lovely guy and a really strong writer. But um, uh, we sent him off to do a draft of the script, and unfortunately, Dick had a little problem with the uh, with the tubes there, you know. Yeah. Uh, and and uh, he, after six months of work, he turned in a script which was just awful. And, uh, and I really felt like he probably wrote the whole thing on the night before it had to be turned in. But, but uh, and the studio was planning on uh, uh, pulling the plug on the project. So I got, I, I said, look, guys, just if you can just wait, let me talk with Dick. So Dick and I got together and I said, let's screen the original movie and write down everything we love about it and put it in the movie. It was just what we did. And I said, mm-hmm. no, well, let's t- take the things that we would like to have seen and let's put that in there. And so that's really how we approached it. And once we, we, we both actually, we, I co-wrote the, 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 the movie with them and um, we took it back to the studio and they said, yeah, we, we love this, we wanna make it. So that, we then got the green light to go ahead with it. Now, the remake, your, your house on Haunted Hill has gained the following, as had the original, and, you know, it's still very relevant today. Uh, when you were making, when you were remaking this film, uh, did it surpass your expectations? Um, I didn't really have any expectations, to be honest with you. You know, I'd been in the business so long that, and, and, you know, after you've been in a long time, you get beat up and you just got to go, yeah, whatever it's going to do, whatever it did. I, I had guessed, I think I, I think I guessed that it would probably be to do something like $40 million in the U.S. That was my guess. And it was not because of the movie. It was just because Warner Brothers uh, promotion, you know, their distribution and all that stuff. So. So that was what I, I guessed that they would do. But. Okay. Now, the paranormal subgenre in horror is the one subgenre that has withstood the test of time in horror. Uh, you know, with movies going back to the 70s and early 80s, like uh, The Changeling with uh, George C. Scott, of course, the Amityville Horror, and it's at an all time high in popularity today. Why do you feel ghost stories, the paranormal stories, have just remained so popular to today? Well, uh, actually, it's because of old people <laughs> like myself. <laughs> the reason that I thought ghost stories would be, be I've always looked at things like, okay, the baby boomers, you look at them, okay, Beatles understand that, you know, the you know, teenagers, you know. So the next group, you know, the next thing you're going to come across are a lot of old people dying, you know, so, so they're going to be thinking about ghosts. <laughs> and and uh, 
um, you know, that kind of thing. So, I mean, that was really, honestly, that was part of it. So, by the way, invest in mortuaries. <laughs> <laughs> now, House on Haunted Phil, uh, Hill uh, is such a well-paced film. Uh, be- beautiful scenery, uh, nicely paced. Is uh, Was that intentionally done under your direction, or did it just all come together that way? Well, you know, I, look, I, like I said, we, we went back and looked at the original film and we said, you know, it, it, it had its own pace, which was had slower back then because that was the pace of films. I said, we need to amp this up, which was the, the idea. And um, uh, so, yeah, I mean, I, I was uh, very heavily into uh, working with Dick on making the picture, you know, move along. Um, the way it worked actually is, is, on the script, Dick wrote pretty much most of the character stuff because he was really good at that. And I think he's better at it than I am. And, uh, and I wrote most of the, the plotting and the, and the, the, um, the horror elements, you know? Mm-hmm. And uh, so that's really how we divided up the work. Um, uh, so, you know, th- that was the, the, the approach that we took. But yeah, I mean, obviously we, we tried to make it move along as well as possible, but I thought, also, I, I wanted to make a movie that was, uh, you know, scary. Um, and, you know, later on, we were winding up making it funny. And the, originally, it was supposed to be just a straight scary movie. Uh-huh. But that's, an, that's another story completely. Because <laughs> uh, two weeks before we started shooting, I started getting pages from the writers of Friends for some reason. And I'm like, oh, okay. So I guess the studio wants to have it in Costello meet Frankenstein. So that's how we <laughs> Oh, man. Uh, now, uh, the 99 version, again, your version of uh, House on Haunted Hill, uh, seems to have been made for like a, you know, a mainstream audience back in the late 90s. Do you think that has helped it remain relevant even to today, as opposed to, I don't know what the right way to say this is, making it for a particular kind of uh, audience that you could pay tribute to the original movie the i mean was it well, made I, yeah, I, for a wide uh audience for the audience in general to uh appreciate this films both horror and maybe even not horror well, yeah i mean look you when you make a film you'd like to have as much you know as many people see your movie as possible you know um but you know honestly uh I'll have to credit, you know, uh, the producers with some of that because it was a struggle, you know, because I, I wanted to make a really just sort of straight ahead scary movie, which may not have performed as well. I don't know. You know, yeah. I don't know whether or not that would have happened. But but so it was it's kind of like when the Beatles had their like struggle going on back and forth between John and Paul, <laughs> you know, it was like they had the rocker and the guy who was like the, the melodist, you know. So, uh, you know, I don't know, but uh, uh, in the end, I was happy with the product. I think it turned yeah. out well. And and um, my bend really is like uh, Tales from the Crypt. When I was doing the Tales from the Crypt was kind of, that's that's me. I mean, <laughs> I mean Tales from the Crypt, I remember those shows, Tales from the Crypt, Tales from the Dark Side. Uh, I used to love watching those little episodic anthologies back in the late 80s and even into the early 90s. Uh, In your opinion, would it help audiences who have not seen the 99 version of the film to see the original uh, and then see your remake? Or was it your intention when you made the uh, your version of the film that people did not even have to have heard of the original film? Well, yeah, I, I mean, look, I, I figured that probably most people were going to go see this never even heard of the original House on Haunted Hill. Yeah. Uh, you know, the studios like to buy those titles because they think that there's a lot of people who like will suddenly, you know, go, oh, it's House on Haunted Hill. But no, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, the the demographic changes every what, 10, 12 years or something like that or, or even sooner. So, you know, I pretty much figured that nobody would remember the original yeah. so i, I had, to, had had to be a standalone movie that you know would be appeal to modern audiences yeah now, now when the movie came out uh a lot of reviewers uh in regards to jeffrey uh rush's performance 
uh, said that he deserved a lot more recognition uh, for his amazing performance on that film. What was it? What was your experience like first working with Jeffrey? Well, Jeffrey, first of all, I gotta say I love Jeffrey. Jeffrey is is just a, he's he's obviously a great actor, but he's also was, was great to work with. And you know, when you know when I'm, you're making a, a horror film. And you have somebody like Jeffrey Rush, who was at the time when we were making it, going off to the Academy Awards for I was I forget the, the movie Elizabeth or something. And uh, you know you, you you go you know why would you even want to be in House on Haunted Hill you know and I actually asked him that question. He says I'm rather tired of playing men in tights. I want to be an action <laughs> hero. I said you're 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 my man. And he and then he told me actually the first time I met him. Uh, uh, he said, he said, well, the night before he'd gone to the New Art Theater and seen The Black Cat with Boris Karloff and Bela Lugosi, I said, you are my man. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds like uh, Jeffrey was, you know, a horror fan and he just wanted to do something in that realm. Would you he say? did. And he, he had great fun doing it. And when I, you know, when I was on the set, I'd be, you know, directing some other scene. I'd look off in the corner and he'd be there studying his line. He took it very seriously. And, yeah. You know, and, uh, uh, I was I was very impressed with him and and the way he conducted himself and like I said I mean he could have been just like taking it for a paycheck but yeah he no wasn't, you know. no no you don't see that in his performance no looking at the final product how do you feel you did in balancing out the uh, fun energy of the film with the scary factor of the film well well I, I hope it's good you know you never know because like I see you know when I watch the movie all I see is cardboard. <laughs> 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 but but you know so so it's kind of hard for me to say but i you know it seems like the audiences enjoyed it i i remember seeing it with a uh, uh an audience and and uh here in, in los angeles and there were a bunch of people walked out and i was oh my god they're they're walking out of my movie mm -hmm. <gasps> you know and i i walked outside and, and i just i went up to this one girl and i said says you don't like the movie no it's too scary uh, I went, <laughs> yes yeah, yes <laughs> uh how involved were you uh with the post-production uh because one of the elements that makes this film so great is the uh the sound the score itself uh was that all you and where to put it and working with the post-production team well first of all, i said nothing is all me i mean it's, it's just you no, know you yeah. were we, yeah we're you know you were in a business where it requires a lot of talent and a lot of different people to work with. Um, you know, as far as the, I, I, I'm, I don't know if you, you can probably guess from my other movies, I'm very much into classical music and I yeah. really, and one of the things about the score was um, I, I was thinking to myself, you know, pipe organ music used to be the, the standard thing when you think of horror movies. And I thought nobody's used it in a zillion years because it's such a cliche. Yeah. I said, now is the time to use it. So, uh, so I had uh, uh, Don Davis, who I thought did a, a wonderful score, and we attempted in with some rather strange music, and he adapted to that. Um, one of my favorite cues is, is I think when they're looking at the uh, saturation chamber when they first come across the saturation chamber, and there's this weird music. It sounds like Middle Easterners. It just it's just wrong, and it's just so perfect for the film and. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, that, that was something I was definitely into. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, I, I was very involved in post-production, you know, basically what happens, you know, I sat there and was there every day on the edit and, and, the, and the sound effects and stuff. And, and, uh, and then we delivered it to the studio. And of course they, they made their changes. I don't think there was many changes that I can think of. It was, um, they it kept just, it, they it kept it pretty much scene. yeah they kept it pretty much like you delivered it to them pretty well i mean there was some there was one scene that I, i'm sorry that got cut out which is it's when um uh it's when uh, uh um, bridget wilson goes going downstairs before she goes downstairs she's walking through the house mm -hmm. and there's this sort of mural that she goes by that just looked like some sort of modern painting. And then as the camera turns and we sort of come around her in front of her, you see that the painting is actually a, a actual creepy painting that's Ooh. been painted in, in kind of some distorted ways. So it looks, you know, and then at the last moment it starts to come alive and chase her. And it was wonderful. And, and what's weird is that like 
uh, you know, Joel, when he sat it, sat and watched it, he like jumped out of his seat and then, then he said, Oh, let's cut it. Why? <laughs> what? <laughs> what do you mean? Let's cut it. Oh, that would have been so awesome. Now the movie uh, is reported to have a budget somewhere in the 19 to $20 million range, which is huge. Uh, is I, that I accurate? Think, I don't think so. I'm, I'm, uh, it, look, it was a it was a studio film, uh, but I'm I'm thinking it was probably closer to like thirteen or fourteen million. Still pretty. I mean, it's that's uh, even for ninety nine. Uh, back well, especially back for ninety nine. We're going over. Uh, that's a long. That's twenty two, twenty three years ago. Uh, working on <laughs> films with that kind of money, uh, what kind of freedoms does it allow you as a director? Well. Uh, you know, look, when you're making a, your, this was my first studio film, obviously I'd made other movies and, uh, and I've made, you know, Creature was a fairly large production as far as budget and not budget, but just as, as far as things, making things and sets and stuff. But this was my first uh, uh, studio film. And when you make a studio film, there's, you have an obligation. And, and also the studio, for your first time at bat, they're not going to give you too many things that you're going to be able to play with. I mean, the the things I was able to play with was the script, the way the film looked, the, uh, uh, you know, the uh, the cinematography, the music and that stuff. But as far as like the casting, like I had almost no saying in, say in the casting. Uh, Which is know, odd. I, in today's world, it's like the director has complete autonomy over the casting. Well, I doubt that's true. And like, I, I'm guessing that the guys who are directing some of these big studio films are probably saying, no, this guy's in your movie. <laughs> it's, it's really a business where the, uh, the tail wags the dog, you know, because they go, well, if we get this, I mean, that's how I wound up with Jeffrey. Fortunately, Jeffrey was on the, was number one on my list and I turned it in and it turned out it was number one on their list. So yeah. that was a no brainer, you know, so I got Jeffrey and then also, um, uh, you know, some of the other people that, you know, for instance, I'll give you an idea what how the film would have been different. My original idea was to have the um, uh, Chris Kattan played part played by uh, John Hurt, which, of course, would have been a completely different movie. Oh, yeah. You know, so uh, uh, but I love Chris Kattan. He did an awesome job. He did. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, he was, I believe, before that or during that, like on Saturday Night Live. And right. it showed his flexibility as an actor to do this. Uh, speaking of the other uh, characters, uh, were there specific elements that you were looking for the cast? And they, and you basically just said that you really didn't have much input as to who got casted. Uh, were you happy uh, with the casting no, I choice? Look, I was happy with the cast. I think, you know, we had a, they were all fine actors and I, and, and, uh, uh, you know, um, yeah, I mean, the only cast member that the only other person that was on my list was, uh, 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 uh Jeffrey, uh, Combs, you know, yeah. and, uh, and of course, you know, that was not a problem getting him on the film, but, uh, but look, the, the rest of the cast I thought did great. And, you know, I loved Famke. She was, she's a really strong actor and, uh, and so were the, all the other actors. Uh, I loved working with Bridget Wilson. She's like a she's like a living Warner Brothers cartoon. Yes. That's the best way I can describe her. She's just she is like that in person, you know. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I mean, and and uh, um, and Tay Diggs, you know, what a what a good what a good cast. Yeah. So so walk us through. Here's this studio film you just directed. It opened up like on Halloween weekend in 1999, if I'm correct. As a director of the film, uh, what do you do on that opening weekend? Uh, you know, do you go and watch it with the crowd and gauge their reactions? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think the I think it first night. I don't think it was actually on Halloween. I think it was on like a Friday night or something. Like we went, yeah. to, we definitely went and watched it with a with an audience and stuff. And, you know, and that was very enjoyable. Of course, it's great seeing your film up on the marquee and, and all that. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, that's what we did. And then I think Halloween night, we actually went to a, a, a club and, you know, partied. So. And, yeah, yeah. Uh, now, were there any aspects of this film that presented you with a challenge that you had not faced before? Well, I mean, 
there, there was a lot of stuff. I mean, just because, you know, it had a lot of, I was trying to do a lot of in-camera effects. And of course that was, that's always challenging. And uh, the biggest challenge to some of that, some of that, that I knew what I wanted to do, but it was trying to get some of the crew up and running on it because it was such odd stuff. You know, we were shooting, I was doing shooting weird frame rates and stuff like that. And, the, and I go, okay, this shot's going to take two minutes to shoot. And all, all the guy's doing is walking across the room from here to there, you know, and everyone's like, you know, and why are we doing this? You know, and of course, and, and then I, I remember getting a, a call from, uh, from, from the producers going, you're spending money on visual effects. Where, the, where, where is that effects? I said, no, no, we did it in camera. Uh. And, oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of effects, uh, what are your feelings on CGI in, in horror in particular today? You know, I think CGI is a great tool. I don't honestly think it'll ever completely, you know, replace uh, practical, um, effects. practical effects because, you know, I, I think Chris Nolan, you know, is a great believer in that too. Mm -hmm. There's something magical that happens that the audience can't put their finger on, but they just know it's real. And when it's real, it's got some energy, you know, uh, I mean, you look at the stunts, you know, the stunts, in those old movies, you know, you know, people were really risking their lives yeah. to do some of those things, you know, and, and there's just something about it that just like, just strikes the imagination. Whereas CG, you can just watch it go, yeah, okay, the, the, the shooting and the bombs that are going off, yeah, nobody's actually being in, injured or even, no, even no. close to being in danger. It's like, and you thought, well, the characters aren't really in danger either, so. That's what I appreciate. I'm a big, you know, supporter of independent films today, and it forces you when you have a lower budget to really become innovative uh, when you don't have the money to spend on the real high-end CGI and visual graphics uh, that studio films have. Uh, do you agree with that? Well, yeah, I mean, you have to, you look, you, you have to, uh, uh, there's two things that you need as an independent filmmaker. One is to be really stupid, okay? And by, by that, I mean, not knowing what you can't do. Yeah. Right? I mean, I look back, I'm scared to death. The first movie that I made for $74,000. If, if I turned that over to a production manager, he would go, no, you can't go all across the town and shoot like 20 different locations at night and day. And, you know, it's like, you know, so yeah, you have to be really inventive when you're, when you're doing it. And uh, also I think as an independent, you have to think, to yourself what can i bring to this that would cost somebody else a whole lot of money now if you've yeah. got if you're a cg person maybe you can do some you know set exchange extensions or do something you know uh do some effects that some other people can't do or you know there's always something that you can bring to it that that uh, would cost somebody else a lot of money and i think that's the way you have to think about it exactly and almost every director that i've spoken to when it comes to uh practical effects versus cgi they all mirror your answer like what you just said there's just something about practical effects that cannot be replicated with computer graphics uh, yeah, there's something. There's just a barrier. I don't know what that is. I mean, they've look. It's, computer graphics have gotten really, really good. There's mm -hmm. no question about it. They do amazing stuff with it. But what they still don't have is that that feeling like you're immersed in it. And I don't know what that is. It's just it's just something that it's it's. I think it's all the random things that happen when you shoot. Like I, I would rather see a miniature. I, I'll give you an example. I was watching The Aviator, mm -hmm. Mario Scorsese's movie. Yep. And, and I remember there's a scene where the, the plane crashes into the houses over Beverly Hills. And I remember walking away going, oh man, look, CG's got, I'm sold, that's great. And I learned to sort of learn later, it was all miniatures. Of course it was miniatures, because it's great. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Uh, now, uh, so let me ask you this. How do you feel about going into a theater, you know, before COVID or even now, and you're going to see like a big budget film, like a Marvel cinema uh, action type film where you know you're going to get a lot of graph. Do you still, you know, put that aside and go in there, not as a filmmaker, but as a fan and try to enjoy the movie? Uh, are you able to enjoy the movie? You know, I try, you know, I try, I always try and like, you know, uh, 
leave that stuff behind when I go see a movie and just like enjoy it. Um, I, I just sort of gauge it by, am I in, am I into the movie? You know, it, does, is it carrying me away? Yeah. And if I'm sitting there looking at the shots, then no, they didn't do their job. You know? Because so. they're supposed to distract you from that and keep you exactly. involved in that's, the story. Movie, most movies supposed to carry you away into a, into a dream. That's, that's one of the reasons why I'm not interested in making uh, dramas. Cause I don't, yeah you know. yeah now as a horror director uh how do you feel about balancing gore blood with good character storytelling well look i mean uh, i think somebody once said uh you know what, what the next day you don't remember you don't remember the plot but you remember the characters true you know, which i think is a true true thing you it know is. you it's really got to be you've got to care about the characters first and then the, the rest of it comes later and as far as gore goes i think gore should be a punctuation it should not be what your movie's about yes it, i don't i don't have any problem with gore obviously i've used it many times in my movies but but it should just be punctuation to a scene i absolutely agree with that now in 2007 they did return to house on haunted hill Definitely because of the success of the 99 film. Were you ever consulted about it? Uh, would you feel about them doing a sequel? Well, actually, it was it was my idea. Actually, I remember I had lunch with Steve uh, Richards, who was uh, the guy over at Silver Pictures. And I said, I don't understand why you guys aren't doing a sequel to House on Haunted Hill. I mean, it's made all this money. And uh, he walked away going, hmm. And that was the last I heard of it. So, no, they never contacted me because, uh, you know. How do you feel about the sequel? Uh, you know, I really don't want to comment on somebody else's movie. All That's I can say true. is, I guess my, the only thing is, I thought he did a, a, a you know, a good job. The, um, I was a little disappointed maybe that they weren't willing to build the sets and, and you know, make it the original. Yeah, yeah. I, mean, I, could, I could see that. I think it's done in Romania or someplace. And, yeah. Yeah, it's amazing yeah. how many movies are now shot in these uh, very uh, unexpected locations. Obviously, it all comes down to dollars and cents. It's much cheaper. Right. Now, House on Haunted Hill, uh, the location is reported to have been shot uh, just outside Griffith Park Observatory. Could you talk more about the location and how did that all work out for you for uh, House on Haunted yeah, well, Hill? Yeah, we, we looked for a long time actually trying to find a place for the Vanneket Institute and... Uh, Somebody suggested um, that we go look at uh, uh, Griffith Park, the observatory. And my initial reaction is, oh, God, we've seen that in movies a million times. I said, but I'll go look at it. And then I realized that when I went there that I walked down the front side of it. And I said, nobody ever shoots this side of it. You know, they always shoot the back side, you know, or the, the parking lot side. I said, let's yeah. go down the hill. And I thought, well, this actually kind of looks different and kind of weird. I said, let's uh, do some extensions on it. Maybe it'll work. And and I, I was totally happy with it once I saw it. And then, of course, Bob and Denny Skotek built this great miniature. Oh, yeah. That. Oh, yeah. yeah. Now, uh, when you realized and knew that you were going to be directing this, uh you know, you had seen the original. Did you go back, do any extra research on the original film uh, besides just rewatching it again? Well, I, actually, I didn't really have to because Terry Castle, William Castle's daughter, was on the set. Oh. Yeah, and she came down and she, she God bless her, she gave me uh, Bill Castle's uh, uh, binder for House on Haunted Hill. So I was able to use that and I kept it and it's great. Uh, but yeah, I mean, uh, uh, I had seen it a number of times. I actually saw it when it first came out when I was a little kid, you know, and so I was pretty familiar with the movie, you know. Yeah. Um, so, now yeah. you are considered, uh, rightfully so, as one of the masters of horror, and that boy, that is a title to have. What are your inspirations when you're going in and directing a horror film? Is there any uh, style well, that you pick from? Well, you know, I, I have a, a a great background in, I, I love silent movies. I love, uh, uh, you know, a lot of movies from the 40s and 30s and, and, and the, of course, the golden era of the 50s. Uh, but, um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, that's really the stuff I pull from. It's like, uh, you know, I love, like, 
the, as I mentioned before, The Black Cat, if nobody's ever seen that, that's the most twisted movie. You know, you couldn't make that movie today. Yeah, <laughs> Bella Lugosi and Boris Carl. I'll get, okay, spoiler alert. <laughs> Bella Lugosi skins <laughs> Boris Karloff alive on a rack at the end of the movie. Okay, <laughs> this is nineteen. I know for back then that's like <laughs> unheard of. <laughs> and and, and Karloff has like encased his has been killing off his wives in some sort of uh, uh, devil worshipping uh, cult and and has them encased in plastic in the basement. Yeah, yeah. But no, yeah. So I love all that stuff, you know, and and movies like Faust. If you've never seen the silent movie Faust by Moore, no, I don't think I have. Oh, that's so good. And uh, you know, of course, the, the classic things like Kevin F. the Calgary. And I would urge people that if you're a young filmmaker, maker, go back and watch silent movies because I know you're thinking, oh my God, they're in silent and they're black and white and they're they're boring. No, they're not boring. They're no. boring only if you pick the bad, the bad ones. It's just like it'd be like picking some, you know, bad movie today and saying, "Oh, well, that's what all movies like." Or, yeah, or like from this period. Now so. let's move to another one of your very popular projects, and that's of course Fear.com. Back in two thousand and two, it was released, and you could say that it was sort of the opening to a lot of copycats. Uh, that I sort of invented torture porn. <laughs> exactly. And it's still being done to this day. And there are some good new ones that have followed the formula of fear.com. Now, we got to remember, this is like, two, you probably shot it in 2001. It came out in 2002. Uh, the internet is now starting to gain steam, you know, around the world. It came out, it was started in the late 90s but back in the early 2000s is when every house started to get the internet in there uh first tell us how fear.com came your way well actually it was an idea that uh, uh moshe diamant who i'd worked with before on creature years earlier he came to me with the idea he wanted to do something about a you know uh a, a, a killer on the internet and i said well uh let's make it so that's like a haunted internet. Yeah. And uh, um, so, you know, I kicked around some ideas and then uh, he had a writer who wanted to write it. I said, fine. So uh, 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 she went away and, and wrote the screenplay for it. And then uh, then we pretty much had a go. It, the, the only thing I would say that was a negative about the film was it got started a little earlier than I would have liked because I felt that... Uh, that we needed to explore some more uh, mm -hmm. scripting within it because the uh, the uh, we got kind of forced into production because of the uh, pending uh, actor strike. Yeah, and it would have just like probably killed the film and so forth. So we we forged ahead with it. But now, but yeah, that film. I mean, wow! Talk about being very having a lot of foresight. It's about basically people committing these acts just to gain popularity on the internet um looking back when you were doing it and that screenplay and directing it to sort of what the world is today and people looking for popularity on the internet uh if you go back to the, when you were shooting it did you ever think that the world would sort of go not obviously mirroring the movie but in somewhat following that direction I actually had no idea whatsoever. I mean, you know, it was just, it, it was just, I thought a, a kind of fun horror premise, yeah. you know, and, and, uh, and my attitude about it was <clears throat> because, you know, you know, when you make a movie for a major studio or, you know, cause it was, it was a good chance that Warner Brothers was going to release it. You know, you want to pull your punches because, you know, you know, the studio is not going to be too thrilled. And, and of course, you know, that was the problem with the film is that we, made a film that was very dark and I tried to make it as truthful in a way, even though it's a fantasy film, I, you know, I said, you know, what's going to be this guy's motivation and yeah. stuff like that. So he's got some dark lines here, this whole thing about uh, uh, Stalin and, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, it, I often say it's, I may have made the darkest movie ever in just about every <laughs> aspect. <laughs> Are you proud of fear.com? 
I am, you know, it's, it's kind of, um, I, I really don't know what, I don't know where it's going to fall yet. You know, I still, yeah, I guess, yeah. you know, it's hard to, for me to really say, you know, so. I mean, like I said, it was sort of the, the prelude to a lot of copycat films that came out afterwards. Uh, all, I mean, I'm not saying that if fear.com never got made, the other copycats would have, they would have definitely gotten made. But how does it make you feel that your, you know, your movie that you directed was one of the movies that opened the door to this whole brand new internet style of movie making? You know, I, I actually, I don't know how to answer that, except it's kind of like when, when, the, you know, when they give you an award at the end of your career. <laughs> you know, oh, thank you. <laughs> you <know? laughs> so I, I don't know really how to, how to respond uh, to that. Uh, yeah, but can... it, it, you know, look, look, I'm I'm proud of the film. I think uh, I think we did some good work. I think Christian Sebald, uh I read one review of his of the film where they said that his cinematography was some of the most beautiful ever shot, mm -hmm. and I, I would agree with that. I think he did an amazing job with yeah, the yeah. cinematography on the film. It was the cinematography was amazing in Fear.com. Now we have a lot of uh, filmmakers like Eli Roth. Uh, they like to really push boundaries. Uh, when it comes to you as a director, do you like pushing boundaries to see how it's going to play off an audience, or do you like playing it more on the safe side? I, I've never been safe ever. Okay. You know, I mean, I always think that uh, that you're doing your best work when you're when you're walking the 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 the, the, the railing of disaster, you know, because uh, uh, that's the only time you're doing really good work, you know, and, and I can't help myself. I Look, I knew when we were making fear.com, I was being a bad boy. You yeah, know? yeah. <laughs> I, I knew that, you know, and, and, uh, and I don't know if you know, there's actually some shots that were cut out of that for the, uh, the American release, the European releases, releases even uh, got some other shots in that. that are, no, I did uh, not know that. Yeah. So. Is the European release available in the United States anywhere to watch? I don't as far think as you it know, is. I don't think it is. Okay. But I think I think you can get it. You know, probably uh, like out of Germany or something like that. So now, looking back in your career, uh, which projects stand out to you as some of the ones that you are the most proud of? Uh you know, obviously, I'm very proud of House on Haunted Hill. I mean, it was very, it was a very difficult film to make, and I'm very happy the way that turned out, and I'm really thrilled the way people have responded to it. Um, you know, probably, uh, I think uh, my first Tales from the Crypt episode is one I'm very proud of, the only skin deep, because it was like, it was like a perfect gift to me. They sent me the script, and I thought, oh, man, I know exactly how to do this. And uh, I felt very happy with the way it turned out. And um, and then the, the Masters of Horror that I did, uh, mm -hmm. you know? um, and uh, you know I'm also very proud of Parasomnia, which uh, not a lot of people have seen, but we're going to do a, a re-release of it soon with uh, some new effects in it. And so, nice. yeah. So, uh, like I said, a large experience. Uh, you have done a lot of also made-for-TV movies. Is yeah. there any difference when it comes to directing uh, uh, a feature film that's going to go to theaters as opposed to something that is going to go straight to television? Well, it's drastically different. It really is. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, um, uh, when you make a feature, you know, it's really all about your vision and trying to, like, fight for it and get everything you can on it. Most television shows, and I, I wouldn't say that certainly I've done both, where it's, it's completely my vision, like Masters of Horror, was I, I, I had no interference. I could do whatever I want. And uh, and also the Tales from the Crypt, that was just by default because by that time the producers didn't care about the show anymore. So, <laughs> so I was able to do what I wanted. But uh, uh, but mostly when you're doing um, TV, it's, uh, the, it's a really a producer's medium. And you're, you're really there to serve what their their vision of it is. And you'd you don't want your episode to look different than everybody else's because yeah. that's not that's not what you're, you're there for, you know. So so uh, and usually the shows that I've been on that were like you know episodic things that I've done were shows where they've been running for a while and you know you just come on and and you know you try try to 
make the day and, and make it as good as you can make it and, yeah. and, and walk away. And, and it's, it's more like a, re- that's like a real job. That's like you, you, you walk in, you do your job, they pay you, you walk out. But, uh, you know, feature films not like that. That's something you nurse along for years, and you sweat and you tear your hair out. You know, I, I mean, I got a bleeding ulcer making House on Haunted Hill. You know, so which of the two do you say? Do you think uh, allows you to be more creative? Well, certainly. Uh, well, I don't know. Actually, I've been very been able to be creative on some of the television shows I've done. Like I said, because of the because of the particular shows I did. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, but, okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. Now, in 2013, you remastered and re-released an uncut version of the 1985 cult classic Creature under its original title, which was Titan Find. Now, right. what are the major differences between the original release and your uncut version? Well, uh, a little backtrack on the history of, of Creature is... Um, when we first released, when we first finished the film, um, we struck an answer print and we were all very happy with it. And then I think we showed it someplace and one of the, a couple of note cards said they thought it was a little too long or the theaters thought it was too long or something. So we needed to cut time out of it. So they mm-hmm. went in and uh, uh, actually I had nothing to do with it. They, uh, they hired a uh, uh, actually, strangely enough, I think it was one of Stanley Kubrick's editors to, to re-edit it, and uh, they re-edited the film. And they, uh, the major things they did is just trim stuff up, and they they took out a few scenes and stuff like that. Okay. Uh, the biggest problem I had with it, I really didn't think it hurt that mo- the movie that much. The biggest problem was that the original version was recorded at Saul Zant Studios at the same time and the same mixers as they were doing Amadeus oh. and the score and the, the, the mix was gorgeous and when they did the thing they remixed it and it was just a, a slap dead you know slap dash sort of thing so it was never had all the subtlety and the beauty of the original oh yeah oh man we're almost out of time but I do want to ask you one more question uh you mentioned the, you mentioned the masters of horror and how much you really enjoyed that fair-haired child plays almost like a fable or a fairy tale. What was the inspiration behind that? Uh, well, it, when I read, read the script, uh, the original script, uh, it was it was always kind of like that. The original draft had a fairy tale quality to it. And I really wanted to play that up and, and make it as much like that as I could. And, uh, uh, you know, there were definitely some heroes involved in that, you know, Mick Garris for supporting everything that I did on it, you know, yeah. and, uh, you know, and uh, Lindsay Pulsifer, who's the star of that, I, I thought she was such a find, you know, uh, and she was such a good sport. She had to be covered in dust for most of it, you know, and she, nobody would go near her because she'd be sitting in her chair just covered in dust. He went up to her like clouds of dust. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, she did, a, I thought, an amazing job. And uh, and Walter Phelan playing the creature, you yeah. know, he did a really good job. And, of course, K&B uh, uh, making the monster and stuff. So Yeah, K&B, that's Greg Nicotero's company, right? Exactly, yeah. Yeah, yeah awesome. Yeah. William, we are out of time. This has been an absolutely fascinating hour. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for, for having coming, me on. Yeah, for being here and sharing these amazing stories, giving us info that we didn't have. Uh, I hope you enjoyed yourself as much as I did. I had a great time, and I want to thank you and and all your watchers. Thank you so much, and thanks, everyone, for your support over the years. Absolutely, absolutely. Guys, thank you so much for tuning in. It looks like YouTube was having some technical issues on the live end, but I will upload the episode there as well. If it didn't stream to YouTube, it appeared everywhere on Facebook and uh, Twitter and everywhere else. So, YouTube people, I will take care of you after the show. Uh, Again, big thank you to William Malone. Thank you to all our viewers for tuning in. Uh, Till tomorrow, stay safe. And on behalf of William and myself, stay walking. Good night.